Welcome back to Carnades.org. Welcome back from our short vacation and hiatus. We are back here with the last 10 days of the 100 Days of Logic, looking at the rules and symbols of predicate calculus. Today we're going to be looking into relations and overlapping quantifiers. These are things that are going to make our basics of predicate calculus get a little bit more complicated, and they're going to add a lot of different things that we can represent with logic. They're going to look something like this. Don't worry if you don't understand that now. We're going to explain it throughout the video. Now, relations are defined as non-monadic predicates. Basically, they're just predicates that cover more than one object. For example, to the left of can't just cover one thing. Something can't just be to the left of. It has to be to the left of something else. There has to be more than one object involved in that relation. You can have relations with three, four, or any number of objects. If you want more information on relations and their properties, check out my video on properties of relations that I did a couple weeks ago. Now, we symbolize statements with a capital letter representing the predicate and a lowercase letter representing the subject. Things like Pat is amiable, Quincy is beneficent, Rio is cool, or Samsung is devious. Similarly, we're going to represent relations with the relationship being represented by a capital letter, K, L, C, or D in these cases, and the subjects that are bearing the relation to each other represented by smaller, lowercase letters that follow the capital letter. So, these relations could be things like Pat knows Tom, George loves Mary, Abe calls Ted, or Ovid denies Greg. You should look into the specific relation you're talking about or check out the paper that you're focusing on if you're curious as to which way the relation goes. Sometimes people will have KPT being Pat knows Tom. Sometimes that might be Tom knows Pat, depending on who you're working with. There's not really a general generic rule that it always goes one way or another. Generally, it goes in the order of the letters, but some relations are a little weird in that way. So it's important to look up that information. Unless the relation has the property of symmetry, it's going to be different, a situation where George loves Mary or where Mary loves George. Now, relations can also have quantifiers out in front of them, as we've seen with normal predicates. The first one, for all x, x bears the love relation to L, so Everybody loves L, or everybody loves Lucy, perhaps. And the second, there exists an X such that J bears the knowledge relation to X, so John knows something. There exists some X that John knows. Those are basic translations of relational statements. We are also going to be introducing today something called overlapping quantifiers. Now, these are another thing where we're kind of building on an idea that we already had. We had the idea of quantifiers as they were, and overlapping quantifiers are just going to be more than one of those binding a statement. Here are some examples of whenever you have two quantifiers. I'll take a look at explaining now exactly what those mean. You can have more than two, but we're just going to take a look at cases where you have two today. Overlapping quantifiers, this is going to be for all x and all y. This one's going to be for all x, there exists a y. There exists an x such that for all y, it's important to note that those two are importantly different. We'll look at that a couple times more in this video. And there exists an x such that there exists a y. That's how you translate these different statements, these different overlapping quantifiers. You can have overlapping quantifiers that overlap on two relations. For all x and for all y, x bears relation d to y, or everything is different from everything. Or there exists an x such that there exists a y such that x bears relation h to y, something is hiding from something. Now, this is the point I was making earlier. There is a difference between for all x there exists a y, and there exists a y such that for all x. Let's take a look. Both of these statements could in some way be translated as everybody loves somebody. However, that statement is ambiguous between two interpretations. 
Either it means each person has someone that that person loves, that they love, and that they each love very different people. A couple people might love the same person, but everybody loves a specific person or their own person. Or there exists one person that all people bear the love relationship to. It should be pretty clear that these are all both very different ideas. That every person having one person that they love and those one people that they love possibly being different is different from all people loving one and the same person. The former of these statements is going to be represented by the first statement for all x that exists a y, while the latter will be represented by the latter statement that exists a y such that for all x. That might be a little confusing now, but I hope it's clear that these are going to be two different statements. Now we're going to take a look at how we can use the rules of inference that we have learned to work with our relations and our overlapping quantifiers. It's important to note that Instantiation is going to always take off the outermost quantifier, while generalization is going to add a quantifier to the outside. Change of quantifier only changes one quantifier and moves the negation one place over. We also have a bit of a stipulation on universal generalization. We had one for indirect and conditional proofs. We're going to be adding another for overlapping quantifiers and relations. So if we take f, y, and we want to conclude for all x, x is f, universal generalization may not be used if the instantiated variable y is free in any preceding line obtained by ei, existential instantiation. Well, what does that mean? Most of the words should sound familiar, except for maybe the word free. What is a free variable? Well, we haven't defined it yet, so let's take a look. A free variable is going to be distinguished from a bound variable. A free variable is one that's not bound in some way by a quantifier. Examples might include x is an f or y is an f. Bound variables, on the other hand, of course, are going to be variables that are bound by a quantifier. So there exists an x such that x is f, or for all y, y is f. This is an interesting example because this contains both a free and a bound variable. The x in this situation, there exists an x such that x bears relation f to y is going to be bound, while the y in this situation is going to be free. Important to note. Now we're going to take a look at why we don't want to use universal generalization in cases like this. So universal generalization may not be used if the instantiated variable y is free in any preceding line obtained by ei. So let's take a look at the following argument. For all y, there exists an x such that x bears relation f to y. There exists an x such that for all y, x bears relation f to y. Note that all we've done is switch the quantifiers. We've already looked at why this is going to be invalid or why these are going to be really different things or things with different meaning. But one way you could end up getting to this invalid conclusion is by using universal generalization improperly. Let's take a look. So. Premise 2, there exists an x such that x bears relation f to y. We're fine so far. Premise 1, standard universal instantiation. a bears relation f to y. Premise 2, existential instantiation. We're also fine with this so far. a hasn't appeared anywhere before. That's our one rule with existential instantiation. Here's where we run into a problem. When we try to put the quantifiers back on. For all y, a bears relation f to y. Premise 3 universal generalization is going to be invalid. Why? Because the y in premise 4 that we want to universally generalize around is free. In fact, it's free in the previous line that was obtained by existential instantiation. Therefore, this is going to be invalid. It's not going to be allowed. We end up with this conclusion. There exists an x such that for all y, x bears relation f to y. Premise for existential generalization, as we've already seen, is going to be something very different from for all y, there exists an x, but if you didn't understand it, then we'll kind of do a different example right now. For all y, there exists some x such that x is the father of y. That's what premise 1 says. It's going to be true if we just limit our scope to people, basically. The conclusion is there exists some x such that for all y, 
that X is their father, that there is some X. There is one X that is the father of everything. Now, you may believe in God and you may believe that there is someone that is the father of everything, but you should be able to concede that even if this is the case, it does not follow simply from everyone having one father or everyone having a specific father. If that wasn't convincing, go back to the love example. It's the same, same idea. Some common mistakes that people can make using relations, overlapping quantifiers, and the rules of inference. For all x, there exists a y such that x bears relation p to y. Therefore, there exists a y such that y bears relation p to y. Mm -mm. No, no, this is universal instantiation, but it's invalid. The existential quantifier that y, there exists a y, has captured the instantiated variable in its scope. When you're instantiating, you're unquantifying a variable. You're taking that x and not quantifying it anymore. So it can't then become secretly or surprisingly quantified by the quantifier you already have in front. You're not allowed to do that. You'd have to either instantiate it to being an x or being a z or being another variable. You can't have it to be the same variable that's already quantified over in that statement. There exists an x such that x bears relation p to y. For all x, there exists an x such that x bears relation p to itself. Uh-oh, this is universal generalization invalid. The existential quantifier has now captured the new x in its scope. We were just trying to quantify that new x once. We actually ended up double quantifying it, and that's not going to work out very well. Once again, it should be pretty clear this is problematic because the x ended up there twice, and it doesn't really seem to follow. If you put an example in for this, such as x is the parent of y, there exists some x such that x is the parent of y. For all x, there exists some x such that x is the parent of itself, really doesn't seem to follow. So it's going to be mistaken, it's not going to work. And finally, there exists some x such that x bears relation p to y. There exists some x such that x bears relation p to itself. Once again, existential generalization invalid. The old existential quantifier has captured the new x in its scope. This is the same thing with the parent example. You can't be the parent of yourself, but you could be the parent of someone else. Just because we're allowed to existentially generalize doesn't mean we're allowed to capture those variables we already have in the scope. To finish up, we're going to take a look at a little proof that is going to use all of these rules and hopefully give you a little bit of a sense of what we're doing here and how to use these rules. If you want to try this on your own, I would suggest you do that now. Otherwise, Follow me, and let's get started. So we have, there exists an x such that for all y, x bears relation a to y, or for all x and for all y, x bears relation b to y. Premise two, there exists an x such that for all y, y is a c, implies it's not the case that x bears relation b to y. And our conclusion is going to be, for all y, there exists an x such that y is c, implies x bears relation a to y. So the first thing we're going to do here is we are going to work with our second premise because we can't really do anything right now with our first premise. And I'm going to be setting up so you know a little bit of a hypothetical syllogism at some point here. What we'll do first is existential instantiation. We always want to do that first when we can to clean up our existential quantifiers because we can't existentially instantiate after we've universally instantiated a variable, but we can do it the other way around. Anyway, we'll end up with for all y, y is a c implies that it's not the case that m bears relation b to y. We've instantiated that x down to an m. Next up, we'll do universal instantiation to get y is a c implies it's not the case that m bears relation b to y. Next up, we will take a look at premise one. We'll go ahead and do commutativity on that. Why, you ask? You'll see in a second. We're going to, as I said, set up a hypothetical syllogism. We need them in the right order for that. Then we're going to just start getting rid of these quantifiers. The first thing, as we always should do, is going to be existential instantiation to get for all x and for all y, x bears relation b to y, or for all y, n bears relation a to y y. Then we're going to universally instantiate that to get for all y, 
m bears relation b to y, or for all y, n bears relation a to y. Note we're allowed to use the m that we already had in premise 4 because this is universal instantiation. If it was existential instantiation, we wouldn't be allowed to do that. Then we'll go ahead and universally instantiate again to get m bears relation b to y, or for all y, n bears relation a to y, premise 7 universal instantiation. Then we'll double negate the first part of our disjunction. It's not the case that it's not the case that m bears relation b to y, or for all y, n bears relation a to y. Then, like I said, we're setting up a hypothetical syllogism, so we need to turn this into an implication. That'll give us, it's not the case that m bears relation b to y implies that for all y, n bears relation a to y. Premise 9, implication. y is a c implies for all y, n bears relation a to y, for 10 hypothetical syllogism. Whew, that was a lot. Now we have our hypothetical syllogism. We just have to fool around a little bit to turn that into the form of our conclusion. First off, we'll do a universal instantiation to get y as a c implies that n bears relation a to y. Then we will existentially generalize to get there exists an x such that y is c implies that x bears relation a to y. And finally, we will do universal generalization to get for all y, there exists some x such that y is c implies that x bears relation a to y, which is the conclusion we're looking for. Before we finish, though, it's important to look and see. We just used universal generalization. There's a lot of rules we have about when we can use universal generalization. And we should notice that the y that we universally generalize does exist in a previous premise. It exists up in both premise 6 and premise 3 where we used existential instantiation. Uh-oh. Let's take a look and see if it's going to be bound in those. Well, in premise 6, we're okay. Because in the first part of the disjunction, there's a universal quantifier binding the y that's next to the x and the b. And in the second part of the disjunction, there's also going to be a universal quantifier binding the y there. In premise 3, we're also going to be okay. The y is still bound by that universal quantifier out on the outside. This is another reason that you want to do existential instantiation first, so that you don't end up with unbound variables wandering around that'll mess up your universal generalization that you're inevitably going to want to do at the end of your proof. That was a little bit complicated. Take a look at the steps, watch the video again if you didn't understand it, and next up we're going to be taking a look at identity, followed by modal logic, and finally some logic problems, a bunch of different problems on this subject and the answers to them. Watch a new video every single day for 100 days here at Carnadies.org and stay skeptical everybody.